The following talk was given at the Insight Meditation Center in Redwood City, California. Please visit our website at audiodharma.org. Hmm. Welcome, everyone. Hmm. The topic this evening is metta, love, kindness, friendliness, all those different words for the word, Pali word, metta. This is uh, continuing in the, uh, the series that we've been exploring over the last weeks, the qualities of the paramis, Parami is a Pali word that basically means perfection or supreme quality, something like that. Good, good thing, good quality, something good to cultivate. And there's a list of these qualities that are understood. I mean, the kind of the, um, I guess we could call it the mythology of, part of the mythology of Buddhism is that the Buddha spent lifetimes cultivating these qualities before he became the Buddha. And there's all these stories about, you know, it, they're, they're very like Aesop's fables, stories about animals and uh, kind of morality tales about animals. And in these stories, there uh, is usually, at the end of the story, it's revealed which of the characters was the Buddha. And, uh, you know, what what the Buddha learned in that lifetime around these qualities. And so they're, mythologically they're understood as the qualities that are supportive for awakening. And they're understood that they're qu- cultivated over a long period of time. These are really the qualities that we explore in our daily lives, in our, in our everyday activities, to see if we can um, find ways to... Um, meet or uh, encourage these qualities to grow. The ten qualities, the ten paramis are generosity, ethics, letting go, renunciation is the word it's usually used. Uh, I like letting go. It tends to have a better rap. Uh, wisdom, energy, patience, truthfulness, resolve, love, loving kindness, and equanimity. And last week I explored uh, resolve. We explored resolve, and this week I'd like to explore the quality of love with you, of kindness. You don't have to go to the, you know, the word love we often have all kinds of associations with. And um, at its base, the quality of metta, and maybe I'll use that word instead of love. Often it's translated as loving kindness, which gives a, a little bit of the flavor. Uh, the quality is that of an open heart. The heart that doesn't exclude anything. The heart that can meet whatever is here without constriction. So it has a quality of friendliness, of connectedness, relatedness. This is really the, the, the qualities of, um, of love. It's associated with a set of qualities, actually, um, in, in the Buddhist understanding. Love, compassion, and uh, sympathetic joy or empathetic joy are understood to be kind of flavors of the open heart, flavors of the heart that is not constricted. And so the, uh, uh, this quality is, um, it really brings in the relational aspect of the Buddhist practice. Of, of I mean, what we do here often You know, we come here, we sit in silence, we close our eyes. It seems to be such a solitary practice. And yet, when we look at what the Buddha taught, there was a lot of relationship, a lot of relational exploration. And the quality of love and the teachings around loving kindness 
um, teachings around relationship, teaching about looking at not harming other beings, all of this opening the heart. You know, so the, the quality of generosity is also a quality that connects us. The quality of ethics, the first two paramis, are also quali- is quality that connects us to other beings. As we uh, explore what it means to be in a non-harming relationship to other beings, we, are, we become more connected. And all of the, um, the exploration of all of the qualities of the, the Parmes brings us more and more into understanding that we are human beings. Human beings like all other human beings. And as we watch our minds, as we explore what's going on in there, begin to be curious about... Um, our hearts, our minds, be curious about what's going on, looking at what's actually happening in the moment. This brings us to that um, parami of truthfulness that we talked about a few weeks ago. We're essentially trying to explore what does it mean to meet this moment as it actually is. And that's not an easy thing to do because we bring so many views, opinions, perspective, ideas into our lives that we're... We're seeing things as we want them to be or as we believe them to be more than seeing them as they actually are. And so as we start to look at ourselves, as we get this curiosity of beginning to be mindful and start looking in our hearts and minds, we start to see, wow, it's kind of humbling to look in here. It's kind of, we see judgment. We see uh, aversion. We see, um, we see negativity directed to others, to ourselves. We see greed, we see pride, we see all kinds of things. And we also begin to recognize, ooh, that doesn't feel very good. It's not that pleasant to notice these things. And so it takes some courage to meet the truth. It takes some resolve, determination, the quality I talked about last week, to meet the truth. In fact, um, I I didn't mention last week, you know, these paramis are also understood to be connected, linked one to another. And I didn't quite have time to talk about how the parami of resolve was linked to those around it. So it's linked to truth, which is the parami that precedes resolve, and it's linked to love, which is the parami that follows resolve. So as we start exploring our hearts and our minds, it's humbling. It's uh, it's humbling to look in there and see what's going on. And it takes some sense of resolve to continue. We have to have some sense of commitment. Yeah, I'm going to keep going. And that commitment partly comes from understanding the wisdom that this is useful, this is helpful. And that resolve is connected to love because it's really helpful to have a loving attitude about what we see in there. To not be judgmental, to not be harsh on ourselves, but begin to recognize this is not just myself that this is about. Actually what we see as we look in, as we begin to explore mindfulness of what's going on in here and begin to see how we overlay our views, our opinions, our wants, our desires, our aversions onto what we are meeting. It's not just about this being. We're seeing, it's humbling to see this, but we're seeing the humbling nature of human experience, not just this individual experience. As we see that, with that commitment towards the truth, with that resolve to look at our hearts and minds, we begin to recognize, oh, this isn't just about me. This is multiplied by six, seven, seven billion people. No wonder there's so much suffering in the world. No wonder it's so hard. And that kind of recognition creates a sense of compassion, of caring, of love. Not just for ourselves, but for 
the human condition. So the, the resolve to explore our hearts and minds opens us to this human condition and opens us to the connectedness that we have with other human beings. So it, it leads onward to love. And it's understood that love perfects resolve, that determination to practice. The classical explanation for that is that as we um, see this connectedness, see the poignancy of the human condition, we are inspired not only to practice to free our own hearts and minds, but to act in the world for the benefit of others. And that it's understood that the the determination, that resolve to practice is supported by, kind of almost um, flourishes when we recognize that our practice is not just for ourselves, but it is for everyone. And so this is love this connection to uh, humanity. And so the quality of love, uh, as we begin to open to this kind of love, not, not our usual way of thinking about love, but of metta, as we open to metta, this connectedness we have, the open-heartedness that we can share with human beings. We see that it not only connects us to others, but it also connects us to ourselves. It's a, it's a beautiful quality that it goes both ways. It's, it's, it's not... Uh, oh, sorry, it's unconditional. It's unconditional towards ourselves as well as towards all beings. And so we get the benefit of that love as well. In the guided meditation, I was encouraging you to just check in and see, you know, that the the act of of mindfulness, of paying attention in this way, is an act of love. It's an act of kindness. It's one of the kindest things that we can do for ourselves. And if we can begin to touch into that feeling that it is a kind thing to do, that um, recognition or meeting that feeling of kindness, creates the conditions for kindness to grow, for it to flourish. This is one of the beautiful things about mindfulness, that as we open to these beautiful qualities, as we open to and become aware, oh, you know, generosity is happening right now, or uh, kindness is happening right now. As we are mindful of that, it creates the conditions for um, that quality to strengthen in our hearts and minds. And it's got this mindfulness on the other side of things. As we, as, as we do, we look into our hearts and minds and we see confusion and judgment and aversion and greed and wanting and pride and all kinds of things, all kinds of reactive emotions. As we look in there and see that with the a heart that is not constricted, a heart that's not resisting. It creates the conditions for those qualities to release and to let go and to become weaker in our minds. So mindfulness has this beautiful, it's like whatever we pay attention to, if it's, if it's a reactive emotion, it, it helps to help it fall apart and weaken. If it's a beautiful quality like love or generosity, it helps it to, it nourishes it and strengthens it. It's, it's almost as if, or maybe we don't even have to say almost as if, it's the, the mindfulness um, uh, warms and nourishes the beautiful qualities and it, uh, the, the reactive qualities of mind cannot stand up to the bright uh, the brightness of the mindfulness. So they, they uh, wither. So 
So I said that the uh, quality of metta is connected to some other qualities. It's connected to compassion and to sympathetic joy. So that open heart, just the simple quality of a heart that is not constricted, that's the basic quality of metta. An open-heartedness, a a non-constricted heart. That heart moving through the world will encounter a variety of experiences. It will probably tend to shut down around some things and not around other things. It will be more easily able to be open in certain situations and not in other situations. And that's our work. We begin to recognize where does the heart shut down? Where does it stay open? How, how, can it, how might I encourage it to stay open? But the, uh, that open heart, when we have more and more skill with not shutting down around what we meet in the world, when that open heart meets suffering in the world, meets someone who is in pain, meets the animosity of our political situation, that open heart doesn't recoil but has a kind of a quivering. There's like a quivering in the heart that is recognizing, oh, there's suffering in the world. That's compassion. So when the open heart meets suffering and doesn't constrict, it becomes the quality we understand as compassion. That quality of compassion actually wants to act in this world It's not a passive emotion. It wants to act to alleviate suffering. It's not the wanting of constriction, though. There's a different quality in the heart that wants something to have it or because it doesn't like something. The the quality of compassion uh, has this movement towards action that's not about constriction but about connection. And then that open heart, when that open heart meets good fortune in the world, meets um, something beautiful in the world, it's like it sings with that. I like the uh, analogy or the phrase sympathetic joy, which is one of the ways mudita, which is the Pali for this emotion, is translated I like sympathetic joy because it evokes sympathetic vibration in music. And what that is, as I understand it, is if you have two strings next to each other, if you pluck one of the strings, then the vibration of that string will resonate the other string and there'll be overtones that create a beauty. And so it's re- it's the, the, the second string is, res- is vibrating in sympathy with, in resonance with that first string. So they're, they're, they're moving together and creating something beautiful. And so this is the quality of sympathetic joy. When the, when the heart, the open heart meets joy in the world, it's like the heart says, joy in the world, that's so wonderful. And it sings in response to that. There's a, a kind of a, an understanding that this particular quality is, um, it's a hard one for us. You know, it's, it's not, it's, uh, we have ideas about good fortune in the world. We have ideas about happiness in the world. And often they have something to do with feeling like if somebody else has something, then it means I don't have something. It's kind of like a zero-sum game we have around happiness. And I think that's partly because so much of what we believe happiness is, is around is material things or, you know, certain kinds of status, you know, uh, things people give us or things that we have. The, um, and that kind of happiness is limited. There's only so many resources in the world. There's so much, so much stuff in the world. And yet the, uh, the quality of joy itself is unlimited. 
It's quite, it's quite an interesting thing. I remember the first time I really felt into this quality. I looked out, I was doing a retreat, and I looked out and I saw a friend of mine walking very mindfully. And I, I could see just by how she was moving that she was right in her experience. And there was... There wasn't jealousy, which I had experienced when I'd seen that before with this particular friend. It's like, oh, she's figured it out. I'm not not as mindful as she is. (laughs) But in this particular case, I saw her and just felt the joy of a being that had that kind of connection. And it was so delightful to not feel that constriction. So um, it's a beautiful quality. It's a beautiful quality. And I think it's, I think it's the Dalai Lama. It was years ago when he said this. I'll quote it as he said it, but you'll see what I mean. He said, it's good to take delight in the happiness of others because then you increase your chances for happiness six billion to one. Now he would say, what is it, seven and a half billion? I don't know, it's... You increase your chances for happiness six billion to one. It's really unlimited, you know, it's, it, but it's a different perspective on happiness, different perspective on joy. So I want to explore a little bit about what it means to cultivate metta. There is a formal practice of metta, which some of you may be familiar with, where we consciously turn and direct the attention towards inclining the mind towards this quality. And we do that by uh, the, the traditional practice. We call somebody to mind, or we call a group of beings to mind, and we consciously explore wishing them well. Explore with phrases May you be happy, may you be healthy, may you be safe. And so you're wishing them well. Um, And so there's a way in which we, we may not feel that in the moment, but it's kind of an inclining. We're, we're, We're trying to point our hearts in the direction of maybe, maybe you'll be okay. You know, maybe it's okay to wish this person well. So it's a, that, that, that kind of a practice is possible and it is a way to cultivate metta. And if I have time, I'll talk a little bit more about it at the end. But what I'd like to explore here is how metta is cultivated right through however we're practicing. We're pra- if we're practicing mindfulness... In, in whatever way we're practicing mindfulness, whatever we're attending to, the teachings on mindfulness encourage a, um, a friendly relationship to experience. And in fact, there's one place in the teachings where the Buddha encourages us to develop mindfulness accompanied by loving kindness. Develop mindfulness accompanied by compassion. And develop mindfulness accompanied by joy. There's another list, which I won't go into details here, but it's it's said to be or understood to be a a, a list that is special to the teaching of the Buddha. And it is a, a list that describes basically a path of awakening. They're called the seven factors of awakening and they are qualities that as we practice they're strengthened and cultivated and these are the qualities of mindfulness, investigation, energy, uh, joy, tranquility, concentration and equanimity. And there's one teaching where the Buddha said cultivate these qualities with love. It says... How is loving kindness developed so that it is of great fruit and benefit? One develops the awakening factor of mindfulness accompanied by loving kindness. Develops the awakening factor of investigation accompanied by loving kindness. Of energy accompanied by loving kindness. Of joy, of tranquility, of concentration, of equanimity 
develops the enlightenment factor, the awakening factor of equanimity accompanied by loving kindness. And the fruit of that practice is understood to be freedom. The heart that releases, the heart that is unconstricted. And so what does this look like in practice? What does it mean to develop the enlightenment, the, the, the awakening factor of mindfulness accompanied by loving kindness? There's different ways I see this working in practice. I'll, I'll, I'll talk about a couple ways. One of the key ways is I read that, develop mindfulness accompanied by loving kindness. To me that says, cultivate an attitude of kindness with mindfulness. Cultivate kind mindfulness. Cultivate loving attention. So it's, a, it's an exploration of our relationship to what we are paying attention to. We're noticing whatever is arising, a pain in the knee or a delightful sensation in the body or a mood of uh, happiness or a constriction of worry. Exploring that with mindfulness, seeing if it's possible to bring a kind attitude to that awareness. Can we know that painful knee sensation with a friendly awareness instead of an awareness that's like, I wish that hateful, that painful knee sensation would go away. So it's, uh, it's exploring what does it mean to have uh, that kindness, that kind attention associated with our mindfulness. A way to explore that is to check in. What is our relationship as we're being mindful? We can do this from two sides. This is kind of the two ways that I was uh, exploring. One is that we just practice mindfulness and from time to time check in. And what is my relationship? We'll find a variety of relationships as we pay attention. As something pleasant is happening, we'll likely find liking and wanting more of it. Uh, Some greed there. As something unpleasant happens, we're likely to find some aversion happening. And yet, so we might notice that. It's like, okay, I'm noticing that painful sensation and I see I don't like it. Then rather than saying, oh, I'm supposed to have a kind attitude towards that pain, we take a step back and see, oh, what's happening is that there is this pain and I don't like it. Can that be okay? Can that be okay? Can I allow that? Can I have a kind attention to that? So it's, it's, it's kind of broadening the container and seeing, okay, I've seen this is going on. It's not so likely that, I mean, sometimes, sometimes when we see our relationships to experience, they don't withstand the light of mindfulness and they go, wow, that's not necessary or that's not useful. Sometimes, actually rarely is my experience, you know, but sometimes that happens. But what we can explore there is, oh, I see what's going on is there's this knee pain and I don't like it. Oh, okay, I can, I can know that. I can allow that. So sometimes I talk about cultivating an allowing attitude, which to me brings in this quality of kindness. Can it be allowed? Whatever is happening, can we explore? Can I allow that? Can it be okay? So as we uh, practice mindfulness and check in from time to time, just check in, and what's my relationship to this? We may find an okayness. We may find that our relationship is, oh, well, you know, it's okay that this is happening. It's no problem. No problem is happening. What I'd like to propose at that point is that you recognize what is the feeling of it being okay that something is happening? What is the feeling of no problem? This is what one of my teachers, Saida Utejaniya, calls wise attitude. An attitude that is not rejecting or holding on to anything that's happening, but just is okay with the flowing of what is going on. 
that wise attitude has different flavors to it. That in my experience, as I have explored and begun to look at, well, what is it like when I'm okay with something? You know, it's like often we might just say, well, I'm okay with that knee pain, so why don't I just keep looking at the knee pain? And we can do that. We can keep, you know, noticing the impermanent nature of the knee pain or just feeling into that or just whatever the next thing is. Or we can also recognize, wow, there's okayness with that knee pain. What does okayness feel like? And it's not that we, it's, I'm not encouraging like a turn back and look at, you know, let's just make the okayness front and center. But it's kind of a step back. It's like, okay, okayness is happening in the field of this exploration. Can I know what that okayness feels like? As I've explored more and more that side of the attitude, there's so many different beautiful flavors that can be present there. It might feel like gratitude of, wow, I don't have to be caught by that thing. And we land in the experience of gratitude. It might feel like kindness, like, oh, poor thing, you know, poor knee. Not, not in a way that's like pushing anything away or, or sappy or anything, but just like, oh, this is a human, human being that's experiencing pain and there's this connection. Or it might have the quality of compassion. It might, it might simply feel like okayness or no problem. Those are more in the terrain of equanimity, of balance of mind. So as we uh, explore mindfulness and begin to check into our relationship, we may begin to notice or be able to see this quality of love at work in our mindfulness practice. As we're exploring meeting experience without pushing it away or holding on to it, it it brings love along. So we can step back and begin to touch into that, feel that. And equally, you know, we, we will see times when we step back and say, what's my relationship to what's happening? And we find aversion or greed. We can step back and say, okay, well, can I be okay with that? At times we may need to be a little more... Uh, active, or maybe it might be that we can remind ourselves, you know, actually bring in thoughts to remind ourselves, kind of a Dharma coach, you know. Might it be possible to be okay that this is happening? Can I allow this to? During a recent retreat, I was exploring with the students this aspect of allowing a lot, and one, um, one of the students um, said that that was, that was a tool that he just started using. It's like, whatever came up, it's like, you're allowed. Oh, you're allowed too. Okay, and you're allowed too. Kind of meeting everything with, okay, and you're allowed. And he said it was like magic. You know, it, it really helped to shift the conditions so that there wasn't so much resistance. And we have to recognize that that doesn't always work either. (laughs) You know, sometimes our mind is so caught that what we get to do is, you know, sometimes what the skillful thing to do is, is to say, wow. You know, what the kind thing to do is, is to say, yeah, this thing's happening and it is way stronger than mindfulness is right now. It's like this is a tsunami of anger and mindfulness is like this little trickle. So maybe this is not what I should be paying attention to right now. And that's actually kind. Again, that's bringing in love to say, no, I'm just going to redirect the attention. I'm going to let that sit to the side. It's not pushing it away with aversion. It's not saying it's bad for being there. In fact, my practice around this was to, it's kind of like I bowed to that thing. It's like, I see you. I see you. You're so important, I know, and you want to be paid attention to, but I can't do it right now. But you can stay in the room with me. 
and I'm going to put my attention over here right now. And so it was a kind of a friendly way. So cultivating that friendliness, even when turning away. That was very, very powerful for something that was overwhelming. Learning how to re, um, redirect the attention with kindness, with friendliness. And then, so that's kind of exploring the attitude Uh, what the attitude already is. You know, as we're being mindful, we can look and check and see what's going on. What's already happening in the mind? Is the mind okay with what's happening? Is it reactive to what's happening? So that's one side of this exploration around love with mindfulness. Another side of it is that we can actively kind of incline towards friendly attention. If we're Um, You know, paying attention to the breath, for example, we might, um, with each breath, kind of just remind ourselves, okay, can this be, can I be friendly with this breath? Is there a way to, to be with this breath in a friendly way? Sometimes I find, you know, cultivating a sense of um, comfortable you know, can, can this breath be really comfortable? And that kind of feeds back to being a friendly thing to do, to experience the breath in a comfortable way. So we can play at times with, you know, kind of like we actively cultivate metta in the metta practice, in the formal metta practice. We can explore what does it mean to cultivate a loving attention? Is that possible? Sometimes even just a reminding myself Okay, loving attention, that's, that's a useful thing. You know, even just that reminder can create the conditions for it to be more available. It doesn't... We have to be careful with this because we can get hooked by trying to do it. By trying to, you know, and sometimes it works. You know, sometimes we we incline towards loving attention, and there it is. And it's like, wow, I know how to do this. But what happened there is that the conditions came together, and there was the inclining of the mind at a particular time when the conditions were were ripe for that uh, loving attention to be become available. And so we can try it. We can explore it. But if it doesn't work or it doesn't happen, the loving thing to do then is to, okay, let's just go back to what's here. Can I be okay that loving attention isn't immediately available? So I want to leave some time for... um, for comments, uh, maybe I'll just say a few, a few more words about ways to cultivate love. I mostly was talking in this last bit about cultivating it through the mindfulness practice. And that, that mindfulness practice is mindfulness on the cushion, mindfulness in daily life. Uh, but there are also some ways that we can explore um, encouraging this quality of kindness in our daily lives as a kind of a, you know, like informally or practically, a practical way, practical ways to do this. One of the most helpful, again, with using the understanding that as we um, can be mindful of kindness, when we're mindful of kindness, it increases it. Just kind of pick Pick a, a stretch of time where you incline yourself to recognize, I want to I be mindful when kindness arises naturally. I just want to notice it. It's like it'll come and go. Kindness comes and goes for us, but often we miss it. We're not consciously aware that it's there. And so this is kind of an orienting to, can I, can I catch it? Can I know kind, kindness is there when it's there? At the end of the day, you might kind of review back the day and reflect, yeah, actually, thinking back on the day, there was, there was kindness in various parts of the day, and I didn't quite catch it. Now, this is not, this is not an encouragement to, to judge yourself about that, but, but just to recognize kind of how much it, it can happen for us. And then as you review in the day, the next 
uh, part of that review would be, well, I'll just, I'm just going to keep trying to see if I can see that. See those moments of kind, kindness when they arise. Feel it. Be with it. That activity. I mean, first of all, it feels good. Kindness feels really good. You'll get a hit of, of delight in the feeling of it. And it cultivates it. it. It creates the conditions for it to be stronger. So just noticing when it's there. And then noticing the conditions in your life that help kindness to be present. So this is kind of like noticing, you, you might begin to recognize, okay, some days there's less of that capacity to be kind and some days there's more of it. What, what are the conditions that support kindness? For myself, some really simple things, you know, getting enough sleep, having enough food, you know, not being hungry, not being late. That's a good one. You know, if I'm rushing because I'm late for something, boy, it's really easy to get annoyed with the person in the car in front of me. If I have plenty of time, it's much easier to have a sense of kindness. So there's some conditions that we can recognize. Oh, these conditions support kindness. And then cultivating those conditions, encouraging those conditions in your life. Another... Um, fun one, I like this one as a practice, is to follow through on acts of kindness when they occur to you. Um, you know, so if it occurs to you, I mean, this is, is not, and, and you can actually play with this too, sometimes recognizing, um, I'm going to play with acts of kindness even if I don't necessarily feel kind. And if you play with that, it's, it's useful to recognize, okay, that's... Um, I'm, I'm, this is kind of an inclining in that direction. I'm going to act kind and see how it rebounds on me. You know, how, does it, how does it land to have done this kind thing? And, you know, simple things like letting somebody, you know, letting a mom holding a baby in front of you in the store or something, you know, or, or letting somebody have an easy merge on the freeway instead of rushing up to close the gap. I mean, just little things you can play with acts of kindness, and then see, how does that land? How does it feel? So you can both follow through on acts of kindness when they occur to you, and then uh, also engage in acts of kindness. There's that bumper sticker, what, practice random acts of kindness? You know, um, follow, follow, Do some acts of kindness and, and be aware of how it feels. What is it like to do that? There's many, many ways um, to do this. And I find in daily life, creativity around practices is helpful. So what, you know, whatever you find nourishes kindness for you, exploring that. So I think that, um, you know, We may, at times, fear the open heart. Um, Fear that it will be hurt. Uh, If if I'm too open, I'm too vulnerable. And this is where the next quality comes in. Uh, The next one that we'll talk about the next time, not next week, but the following week, come away next week. The quality of equanimity. Um, That... uh, you know, the open heart has the capacity to meet the joys and sufferings of the world and yet needs that equanimity to not be overwhelmed by the suffering and not be kind of swept away with um, the joys either. To not constrict around the suffering. That's... that's um, a real edge for us to not constrict when there's suffering in the world. And sometimes we might feel like, well, if I'm not constricting, it means I don't care. But that's, you know, that's the perspective of constriction speaking. And if and when we begin to recognize this open heart, we we start to, and and we can have trust in that heart that we're not going to be overwhelmed there, we'll see that that 
uh, that heart acts in the world and responds in the world. So it's not, it's neither a place where we're overwhelmed and it's not also not a place where we're just kind of sitting around saying, oh, everything is fine. My heart's open, no problem. That's not what that is, what this quality of the open heart is. The open heart wants to act in the world. And so the, you know, it, 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 it's, a, it's a process, I would say. It's a process to begin to, um, you know, see where we constrict. Open, open to that. And it's like, okay, constriction's happening. Can I be okay that the heart is resisting? That's the beginning. That's the doorway towards this cultivation of love. So there's a few minutes for comments or, or questions, thoughts, reflections about this topic. Well, this isn't precisely on topic, but it's close. Um, the, the open heart uh, needs to recognize that the center here runs on a principle of dana, of generosity and giving. And so volunteering to clean up, volunteering to help pay the bills is an important thing. And so I just thought I would mention that. Because <laughs> the, it's the, true. We are a completely uh, volunteer-run center. And so any any... Any offering that you make in that way is gratefully, gratefully accepted. And then perhaps on topic, I was thinking that the attitude of loving kindness as applied to that hurting knee is an interesting one because one doesn't, I mean, one isn't wishing for the loving kindness when we wish that our, that someone that we don't really know but see all the time, that they're well and that they're happy wishing that our knee be well and be happy can get a little more stuffy. Yeah. But still it can be the same, just open-hearted wish yes. that another part of us doesn't suffer. It can, it can be that, but it also can just be simply a non-constriction around the experience. That's kind of what I was pointing to. It doesn't have to be the active wish, may you be at ease, but just the 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 ability to not be resisting or holding on to experience. And um, so another piece of that, what I think, so you, you point to something that I didn't mention that I think is a really important piece to bring in. You know, as we bring that quality of loving kindness to something like a knee pain, you know, what we do see um, often is that much of our uh, reason for constricting around the knee pain or pain, many, many kinds of pain, is uh, because we have some idea that it's going to get worse or, you know, our minds will go to cancer, you know, within seconds. It'll go to, I'm never going to be able to walk again. You know, it's amazing how fast our mind does that. And a lot of what our reaction is about is not so much the actual pain, but the thoughts about it. And so the exploration of kindness is creating the conditions where we can actually meet what's here. We actually can meet, oh, well, there's a twinge there. And then there's a little bit of a worry. Oh, and feel how that twinge ramps up as the worry happens. And then, oh, okay, maybe I can just be with the twinge. But what the attitude of love also will do is if that twinge turns into something more, more uh, serious, it will create the conditions for the mind, for wisdom to recognize it's time to move. So, so that it's not just about, you know, sitting with something. Again, it's, it's not about non-action, but it is about meeting what's actually here. And so as we meet what's actually here, what may be called for with that loving attention is actually to shift postures. And so the, the, the loving attention allows us to tease apart when 
the, it's like our, 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 our mind, our, the mind, the wisdom of our system begins to inform us, yeah, this one, this one needs to be moved. <laughs> so so the, that kind of attention, that quality of attention serves us on both sides of it. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Hi. Hi. Um, it, good talk tonight. Um, and I feel so good to be here. Um, so what can you say on me? You know, like you were talking about the world, us being around people in the world that are in pain. But what about you and your own yeah. core pain? Because yeah. right now I'm in my core pain and I'm loving myself in my core pain. I'm not putting it on anyone. So do I just allow that to unravel itself? Uh, well, I would say that this loving attention creates the conditions for us to understand what part, I mean, as you said, you know, part of it is your own part, but part of it can be something in the world too. And what I would say is that the loving attention begins to help the wisdom understand what part is our own holding and constriction and core pain and what part may need some action in the world, what part may need some action internally, what part does just need to be witnessed. And so I would say the, the starting place is witnessing. The starting place is witnessing and what I see happening is in that witnessing there's a wisdom that begins to help the, the mind sort through these things and it doesn't happen at an intellectual level. It, and sometimes things begin to unravel and we don't even know why they're unraveling or what's unraveling but there's, a, there's an understanding of a releasing happening and there may be an understanding of an action that may be necessary. So, um, and, and sometimes with those core pains, uh, those really deep core pains, we can be overwhelmed. And so really uh, recognizing when it's appropriate and when our mindfulness can meet that and, and uh, hang with it. Be with it is the language I'm, I'm liking these days. Can you be with it? You know, just like let it be and be with it. Um, if that's possible, then that's, uh, that's almost always the way to go. And, and, but there are some times where we can't be with it because it, there's so much that's hard, hard to meet. And those are times to begin to, to recognize, okay, maybe I can touch into it for a few moments. And then it's time to step away. So learning some skillful tools about when it's, when it's not time to be paying attention to it. And then, when you, and then when you talk about constriction, can you just speak on, you know, broadening, broadening that? What do you mean when you say constriction? When I say constriction? Do you mean... The constricted heart. Because w what I hear you, maybe you're saying is being open to it, okay? So is that n cutting off the... Re you know, well, I would say we're not trying to cut off anything. So if there is, a, a, what I mean by constriction or that when the heart is open, there is a feeling of, uh, you know, it's kind of like the heart feels like jelly. You know, it's not, it's, it's, it's like just wobbling and responding and resonating with what's there. And it's not blown to pieces with anything. And it's, it's not hard and cracking with anything. It's just kind of, like <laughs> kind of wobbly that way. Um, but, but there are times when it rigi gets rigid. And that's what I mean by constriction is a feeling of the heart getting rigid. And yet, what, sometimes what we have to do with that is, is not to try to say, oh, heart, don't be rigid. I mean, good luck with that, you know. Um, <laughs> it, but, but to kind of step, take a step back and say, oh, this is a human being whose heart feels constricted right now. Can I be with that? Is that possible? If that's possible, again, you know, you're in the terrain of loving attention. Sometimes it's not. Sometimes it's so painful that we just have to, you know, change the channel, go outside, be, you know, look at a tree, look, look at a, a, a leaf on the sidewalk, you know, just anything to, to change the channel. 
um, you know, even in a room, one of uh, the tools that I find so helpful is just look at something for a second and then look at something else for a second. Actually look at something and then look at something else for a second. You can break a, uh, a mind that's really tight by just shifting attention every second for even like two minutes. That's very powerful. You know, just as a way to release that constriction a little bit if, if you can't hold it with mindfulness. And there are definitely times where that's not possible. Yeah. And we need to stop. So, thank you. And I'll see you in two weeks.